Hello, good evening, and welcome to the TNT show. Uh, tonight, we are well into our second century of, uh, of the TNT shows. I'm John Drummond, and I'm your host for the next 60 minutes. Uh, thanks to you, the TNT show and India Live are growing and delivering more exciting shows than ever before. And incidentally, you can watch this show on YouTube. Uh, you'll see it on, it's streamed out on India Live Net, uh, to Facebook, TikTok, Twitter, and as I said earlier, to YouTube. Plus, if you go to YouTube, you can see all the previous shows. And like I said, uh, we're well into our second century, 115, 116 now. Uh, and now you have a chance uh, to support this vital channel. Uh, if you get a chance to donate to the crowdfunder, uh, it would be uh, very gratefully received. For example, you might be upset by the media coverage of political events, where sometimes it appears that journalism is jumped in favour of uh, stenography. Uh, if you're looking for an alternative voice, well, you found it. We're here for you. But the big question is, are you there for us? Please donate uh, when you see the information on the screen. And you know, it's been another great day for British democracy. Uh, so far, Rishi Sunak's government uh, of, in his, his words, professionalism and accountability has sacked the guy who ended the barrister strike, a gentleman named Brandon Lewis, and has replaced them with a person who caused the barrister strike, Dominic Raab. Uh, the new PM also promises integrity and then appoints the disgraced former Home Secretary as his new Home Secretary, scarcely a week after she was fired because she broke the rules. <laughs> well, tonight we are talking to a very special guest. We'll be discussing all things Brexit with a true expert on the subject, Professor Chris Gray of the University of London. Now, Chris is here for a full hour and taking your questions live. And there's still time to get your question considered. Uh, you'll find the details at indylive.net. Well, the TNT show stands for The Nation Talks. So in many respects, this is your show. We're live and we're free. So no license, no problem. Now, to our guest tonight. Tonight, The Nation Talks to Chris Gray. Hi, Chris. How are you? Hi, John. I'm very well. and I'm very pleased to be with you. Good. I'm very pleased you could make it. Now, we'll be talking about Brexit. Uh, and if you, if you say, say, for example, somebody landed from Mars and turned up on your doorstep and said, what is Brexit all about? <laughs> well, <laughs> what would you say? I think I'd probably say, um, I think it might be a good idea for you to go back to Mars. <laughs> it might be the best thing. But, um, but it's, you know, but look, it's, it, 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 you know, it's a great question and it's, and it's, a, and, and, and it's a huge question, isn't it? Um, but I suppose that without delving back into you know into in, in, into all the reasons why we had the referendum in 2016 and all the reasons why it, 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 it had the result that it did i think the key thing we would say to to the visitor from outer space is that is that something was voted for that was not defined in any particular way um that was based on a whole lot of things which are best were questionable assumptions, and at worst, were outright lies. Um, and the, all of the things which have followed since then, then, grow from that fatal flaw, because what it meant was that there was no, uh, there was no plan to implement, there was no agreed way of implementing uh, this, this, uh, th th this Brexit decision. And so it was almost like, um, it's almost been like this kind of journey where where you're on an aeroplane and, and, and you're actually sort of building the air, the aircraft at the same moment as you're as, as you're in flight so it's sort of inherently unstable um and um and of course in the process it meant that because it wasn't defined in any particular way that all kinds of different people had different versions of what it was and that meant that many of them were bound to be disappointed and actually in the end all of them in some way were about to be disappointed um, because, um, because you know because of the fact that so many of the promises that were made were things that just could not be delivered and then in the process of all that about sort of building the airplane or rebuilding the airplane in flight um, what we have seen unleashed is just an extraordinary kind of political and of course economic turmoil i mean it's not it's not a coincidence that we're now 
as you say, we've now today got our, 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 the new Prime Minister, who is the fifth Prime Minister uh, since 2016, since the referendum. Um, you know, I mean, I, I can't bring to my mind what, it, what you may be able to remember. I mean, how long would it take us to have the previous five? I mean, I think it would take us back to, you know, Jim Callaghan or something, you yeah. know, in the 1970s. Um, and, and, you know, say, you know, it, 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 there's various reasons for that, but I would say the core reason for that is this political turmoil that was unleashed by, um, by you know, you know, by Brexit and by not having a plan for Brexit, and of course, we're still living with the unfolding economic effects of that. Isn't there also a terrible irony at the heart of all of this, which is that, according to some people, David Cameron agreed to the Brexit referendum to, in order to unite his party because yeah. it was driven by the pro-Europeans and the anti-Europeans. And we've ended up with a situation where his party, you could be excused for thinking, is more riven than it was back then. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and I, mean, you, I mean, the whole of this story, I mean, there's so many different ways of understanding the Brexit saga, but one way definitely is just is to see it as being very much driven by the internal politics and the internal disputes within the Tory party and this kind of civil war about Brexit that they have been having really, I mean, you could argue going way, way back you know, to the 1970s, but certainly going back to 1992 and the Maastricht rebels and the people that John Major, you know, called famously called the bastards. Um, and then, of course, you know, David Cameron, as you say, uh, I think in his first uh, speech as Tory party, conference speech as Tory party leader before he was prime minister, said, you know, we've got to stop banging on about Europe. Um, and, um, uh, you know, I mean, you know, if there's ever been a sort of a, a, a prophecy or a suggestion that you know, it looks ironic now, that's it. Um, and of course, it hasn't it, ha it hasn't had that effect at, at all. And, 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 and one of the reasons why is, and it does relate to the no plan business, but it's a particular issue to do with it, is that as soon as they had got, um, well, as soon as it was even agreed that they were going to have a referendum, the sort of the Brexit extremists, you know, I tend to call the Brexit ultras, they immediately started pushing to say, oh yes, but it's got the question's got to be phrased in a particular way. Oh yes, and we can't have the 16 to 18 year olds voting. Um, uh, and, and, uh, and, 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 and getting their way on all those questions because it was felt, Cameron assumed, I think, that he was going to win. And it was felt, well, if we don't give them their, their, their way on those questions and, and the franchise, you know, who the electorate was going to be, oh, then, then they would complain that it had been rigged and so on. So they were given all that. And then they won, to their amazement, I would say, and by the skin of their teeth, relatively speaking. Um, and ever since then, it's been pushing for, you know, something more and more extreme. You know, we can remember, all of us, how for years and years and years they were talking about Norway as, you know, the model for how things would be, or Switzerland, perhaps. And then suddenly within... Um, within, um, uh, not all of them, but, but many of them was in it. And many people who voted for it, for Brexit, would have thought, expected, well, that's what it's going to be. And then literally within, I would say, hours of the referendum result, they were coming out en masse saying, no, 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 that's not what it meant at all. That would be a complete betrayal. And so we got pushed in a harder and harder and harder sort of direction. Uh, and now, uh, even when you know, we, we've, we've left in, 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 in there's many hanging threads, but, you know, we have left the EU. Um, of course, then the next thing starts up with is, oh, well, but now we've got to leave the the um, the uh, the European Court of, of Human Rights, which, of course, has nothing to do with the EU. But, but, but you see how all the way along they've pushed for something harder and harder and harder. And now we have a Tory party, which is split again. Um, still, I would say, over Europe, I mean, they've purged pretty much all of their Remainer MPs. Um, but um, but still, there's this sort of distinction between the kind of the more one nation Tories and the and the really sort of you know Brexit ultra European research group types. So yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, it didn't it didn't it was it was it was it was in in so many ways about trying to assuage these divisions in the Tory party. Uh, and what have we got? Yeah, I mean, some people have argued that, um, that I mean, Brexit is an economic crisis perhaps, but it was born out of a constitutional crisis, i.e. that uh, under the first-past-the-post system, uh, which in the past always kept extremist, extremist groups out of the 
body politic because it was so difficult mm. that people actually found a way to circumvent mm. that mm. Mm. benefit of the UK constitution yeah. by actually taking over one of the main parties. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's interesting. I mean, I mean, I guess there's two dimensions to that. I mean, one is there's clearly there was a degree of kind of UK entreism into the Tory party, and we can see some evidence of that. But I think the other thing was how UKIP, without having any uh, seats in the Westminster Parliament, well, apart from people who defected from the Tories to, to, to UKIP a couple of times over the years, but without without having that, still they managed to exert an enormous pressure from the outside on the Tories, primarily, who was so scared of um, uh, of 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 losing votes, uh, you know, uh, to UKIP, and of course. One of the iron, huge ironies is that that was made all the more effective because of the representation that UKIP was able to achieve in the European uh, Parliament because of the fact that, of course, those elections were not first past the post. They were um, they were proportional representation uh, elections. And so by sort of getting into this institution, which they, uh, the European Parliament, this institution, which they despised and, and which were, they were right to the end extremely sort of disrespectful of it gave them uh, a point of leverage uh, back home uh, in the uk they also had the benefit of uh, i'm thinking particularly about nigel farage now of fairly considerable television coverage in a way that uh, struck a lot of people as being very odd because yeah. uh, normally television coverage is allocated or assigned on the basis of electoral performance, you can't just sort of pitch up at a television studio yeah. and say, yeah. look, I represent uh, Joe yeah. Bloggs and the yeah. cat. Yeah. I would like to uh, give you my views on, on, on Brexit. Yeah, and I think, you know, I mean, there's, I've seen a lot of stats, for example, on, you know, comparing, you know, say when Farage was a member of the European Parliament and comparing his and other UKIP or some sort of Brexit party members' exposure on, pro on BBC programmes like Question Time compared with uh, the MEPs of other parties or, or of the Green Party and so on. Um, I think that, um, and there are also certain decisions made about uh, about, um, I think, uh, access to party political broadcast for elections, which were based on percentage of the vote that had been achieved, as opposed to number uh, in, in Westminster elections, as opposed to number of seats, and so that um, advantaged them. And I mean, I suppose you could say there was, you know, there, there was some fairness in that because they were receiving votes. And I think the other thing, which is, which is, you know, which I suppose, like it or not, is a feature of the media and the television, is that is that certain people are kind of quite good television. You know, and Nigel Farage, regardless of what, you know, people think about his politics, is in a certain way quite a kind of an accomplished media performer. And you could say the same thing, for example, about the way in which, you know, I was very, very struck um, in, the, in the period after the referendum by how much exposure Jacob Rees-Mogg, the Conservative MP, was getting on on television stations, and I think even though actually he hadn't been, he was a, he was always a Brexiteer um, and well known within Brexiter circles, let's guess. But he wasn't, uh, didn't have a particularly high profile during the referendum campaign. But I think that you know TV producers sort of saw him as having an as kind of like an entertainment value because of this, what I think is kind of quite a fake sort of persona in a way about you know this sort of po you know, posh sort of. Um, person from you know apparently from the nineteenth century or whatever, um, uh, but you know TV you know, you know t t t TV news is also a form of entertainment, and I think that also explains um, explains some of that. Yeah, we, we've had a question about Northern Ireland. Uh, our questioner uh, believes there there may be an election announced on Friday uh, for Northern yeah. Ireland. Uh, and I would have thought that Northern Ireland was a particularly difficult thing uh, for the government to handle in terms of Brexit. I mean, what's your view on, on how things are going to work out there? Well, it's enormously kind of complicated because what you've got going on there, um, well, first of all, to, to, just to go back to the, the particular issue about what's going to happen on Friday. I mean, the Northern Ireland Secretary, Chris Eaton Harris, has said, that if the power sharing um, institutions are not um, uh, running again by then, which does give, you know, potentially a day tomorrow um, for, the, for that to happen, uh, then he says that then he would, um, 
he, 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 you know, he would trigger in the assembly elections. He's not actually obliged to do that straight away. Um, and so although he said it would be on Friday, we can't necessarily assume it would be the case. And I'm not saying that to be pedantic, but I'm saying it because of the fact that 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 that, 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 that there were two separate there was two separate but related things going on here. One of them is very much to do with Northern Ireland politics and the Assembly and the DUP uh, and so on. Um, and one of them is to do with the uh, to, 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 uh, to, is to do with uh, the negotiations with the EU over the Northern Ireland Protocol. Now these things have become put together by the DUP primarily in terms of saying, well, you know, because effectively their position is to say that, that whilst there is any form of Irish seaboard, or, or some of them even say whilst there's any form of protocol, um, that, that they will not that they will not take part in the power sharing executives. And so they have made that kind of they have made that that linkage. And I think that um, and there was a period I think when the British government was not unhappy for that linkage to be made because it enabled them to make the argument that um, if the EU did not, you know, either get rid of or substantially change the Northern Ireland Protocol, then it would be uh, it would be destabilizing to the to, to 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 the peace process in Northern Ireland and problematic in terms of Good Friday Agreement, and that was meant to be a way of neutralizing, in particular, the American critique of what the British were doing uh, in terms of saying, well. Well, you know, when you are threatening the Good Friday Agreement, and so there was a big uh, attempt by the British government to try to say to the Americans, um, uh, and to Biden, and or certainly to the Biden administration, to say, uh, look, you know, we like you, we want to uphold the Good Friday Agreement, and so, it, so it wasn't in a way unhelpful. But I think that what's happened um, recent, more recently, and it's kind of quite interesting, is that the British government have been pushing to try to decouple that and to try to say, look, you know, we yes, we are going to get on with negotiating the protocol stuff with the uh, EU. Um, but in the meantime, you know, uh, you know, you, you know, there's absolutely no reason why you guys, the DUP shouldn't I think Steve Baker, the other Lord minister used the, I don't know if he said suck it up or, or swallow yeah. it down or, you know, something, some expression like that the other day. Okay. So, um, so then, but but even if the but even if but even if power sharing resumes, um, supposing for example tomorrow the DUP sort of said okay you know uh, we will sort of do that, that's not going to in and of itself do anything to resolve the Northern Ireland Protocol situation, right? Um, and what is going to happen with that, you know, remains really as unclear under Sunak as it was under Trust as it was under Johnson. Because the basic dynamics here, and again, it also it goes back to the internal state of the Tory Party. The basic dynamics here remain the same as they as they as they have been from the beginning. That either the British government agrees a deal with the EU, um, and any deal which is likely to be acceptable to the EU is likely not to be acceptable well to the DUP, but also to key members of the Tory party in particular European research group um, and when I say anything likely to be acceptable I mean again Steve Baker Northern Ireland minister uh, assuming he still is by the way which I don't think has been confirmed <laughs> um, um, you know he made two quite interesting interventions over the last few weeks one which got a lot of coverage in Ireland um, and some here as well, um, was this kind of apology and, and very kind of conciliatory statement um, that was very much but welcomed by the tea shop uh, and the other people in the European Union, saying, you know, we make some apology for the way that we behave during the Brexit process towards Ireland uh, in particular and towards the EU. But on the other hand, last weekend, he made a very hard line statement. And bear in mind, Steve Baker used to be the chair of the ERG and is self-described as the Brexit hard man and a very significant figure for those for those people. And he said, um, you know, there is no there can be no to there can be no sort of compromise about the issue um, of uh, of uh, European law op you know, operating or in his view, not operating in Northern Ireland. Now, I can't see. In, in reality, how that can possibly be agreed by the EU, 
it could be done as a, some kind of fudge, you know, you sort of say, well, it's not directly the ECJ, but it's sort of, you know, and you, and you keep mm -hmm. it you know, in the back door. Um, but would that be enough? So there is the fundamental dynamic. Either Britain does a, a deal with the EU and then has an internal war in the, in the Tory party with the ERG, or, it, or in order to maintain its, its party unity with the ERG, that it doesn't do a deal with the EU, which then has all kinds of consequences in terms of poor relations with the EU, which matters over Ukraine and other kinds of things, um, but also potentially trade sanctions and even, although it wouldn't be immediate, down the track trade war. You have Britain afford a trade war in the middle of an economic crisis. Well, Dunak apparently, when he was Chancellor, argued no um, and, 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 was, and was very dovish uh, on the Northern Ireland thing. But will he be like that in office? Well, you know, eventually. See, so this is very much up in the air. But I would just like to, kind of want to say it's up in the air almost irrespective of the question yeah. of what happens about the DUP going back into power sharing. Does that make I mean, sense? It, it is fascinating. I mean, from, from what I know of the States, having lived there for a short time, uh, I mean, any president or Democrat uh, candidate uh, is going to seize upon any uh, attempt by the British government to as they were, might view it, uh, to militate against the interests of the people of, of Northern Ireland. Uh, uh, I mean, I, it, it, I mean, politicians standing for election will choose any stick they can to beat their opponent with. And, uh, I, and in my experience, uh, Democrat politicians like to have the Irish community behind them uh, and they're unlikely to agree to anything, or they'll be very displeased by anything, perhaps a better way to put it, that they feel is not supportive of yeah. a position that they thought was agreed internationally. But I think, I mean, I don't think it's just, it's, I don't think it's just Democrat politicians either. I mean, I think there's, there are things actually, yeah. you know, there's, there's plenty on the Republican side as well. And, um, you know, and of course we shouldn't forget that apart from the issue of there being, a, you know, the Irish, or the Irish community, uh, historically Irish community in the United States, is that is that is the United States, you know, as 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 uh, as, as as a country, was extremely heavily involved in the peace process yes. itself, um, and has a very strong, you know. So, in other words, I suppose what I'm saying is that at one level, you know, we can say, oh, there's all this kind of sentimental stuff, if you like, about Joe Biden and, and Irish oh. heritage, which is real, you know. And what, Saying it's not real because it's sentimental, but but there's also you know certainly a very um, a very a very unsentimental and hard edged strategic interest on yeah. the part of the United States um, in uh, in Northern Ireland or in, yeah. in and Ireland, you, and you really can't see that changing. <laughs> it won't change, and, and it's not about and, and it wouldn't. Change. I mean, I mean, Trump obviously was in every respect a kind of an outlier. Um, but, it, but, but, but fundamentally, you know, this is not an issue so much of the presidency and the administration. It's about the strategic interests yeah. of um, of the United States as the United States. Yeah. Well, let, let, that's very helpful. Thank you. Let's move on for a second and look at um, uh, what's happening with the Labour Party. Because there's an argument, and I think you... Uh, made this point too in your blog, which I would commend to everyone uh, tonight. It's called Breakfast and Brexit and Beyond. You should all go and take a look, not right now, uh, when the program's through, and check out Brexit and Beyond. You'll learn a great deal uh, from that and uh, become a, a regular subscriber would probably be a, a helpful thing too. But you make the point uh, that what a lot of what's going to happen now is down to the Labour Party and the position of the an approach that it takes. And some people might be confused because they've heard Keir Starmer say things like, my job is to make Brexit work. And they're thinking to themselves, you can't make it work. <laughs> oh. <laughs> What's your take on that? Where's the Labour Party coming from in all of this, do you think? Well, I mean, I mean, Brexit has been, you know, we say that it's, it was, we're talking about it in terms of the Tory party and internal uh, battles, the Tory party um, that maybe led up to the referendum and, and issues beyond. I mean, it's just been enormously difficult for the Labour Party. And that would have been true um, 
that would be that, that would be true whoever the leader of the Labour Party was because of the fact that um, that you know that so many Labour voters in uh, traditional um, working class primarily northern uh, northern England and, and Midlands of England uh, seats you know which Labour had always seen as its heart that's so many of of, of, of the voted uh, uh, for uh, Brexit and yet on the other hand the clear majority of Labour voters nationally voted for Remain and certainly the majority of, of, of um, uh, party members and so on. Um, and so that was always going to create a kind of difficult kind of situation and, and not one that, now in some ways I think Labour always over exaggerated that because of the fact that I don't think they fully recognised that the Brexit for, for, for the Brexit for, for for working class Labour voters in those kind of you know, red wall seats wasn't necessarily, and certainly now, isn't necessarily you know, the most important thing. You know, these people, they, you know, these people may have, have listened to Farage, but they weren't Farages in the sense of you know it being their lifetime desire to to be out of the EU. So it wasn't. You know, so a, I think that the commitment to it was you know wasn't wasn't as sort of deep as all that. But secondly, you know, actually, although you can look at those particular seats. Some of those people in those seats would never have voted Labour anyway, and perhaps wouldn't have voted at all, and, and, and so on. Um, and so, you know, so, so, so you can have fudge that a bit, but still the basic dilemma, you know, definitely, um, uh, you know, definitely remained. And it was never going to be easy for them to say, well, um, OK, but most of our voters have remained, so we can tilt towards remain, because of the fact that the distribution of where those voters are geographically means that, um, in other words, because you may have very large numbers of, of Remain Labour voters, let's say in you know urban seats in London, for example, um, um, but, uh, but but just saying, well, we'll please them rather than the others doesn't help. You know, doesn't really help you, given the fact that your support is is because don't forget the working class, traditional working class support for Labour in uh, Northern England seats have been on the wane anyway for different all kinds of different reasons. Some of which are you know very familiar to Scottish politics because of course you know you know what happened to Labour there. So it was always going to be difficult. It was made more difficult by Corbyn uh, and Corbyn's um, I think ambivalence about Brexit um, and also his um, I think he didn't even wasn't even very interested in it. Actually, he sort of saw it as a distraction from what his main kind of interests were. Um, so now for Starmer, you know, he is very cautious about what to say, um, and I think, and, and, and I can understand that, up, you know, up to a point for the for, you know precisely for those kind of electoral reasons, and not just for electoral reasons, but I think also that the entirety of the British polity, or I think probably here I should say the English polity was really, um, I think, traumatised and made very cowardly as well by the Brexit, what happened after the Brexit debate. And I'm thinking in particular of this climate that emerged in 2016 about you know, enemies of the people, you know, the Daily Mail headline of enemies of the people, uh, that was said in reference to the judges in the Article 50 case, but it was part and parcel of, um, it was part and parcel of an extremely intimidatory kind of uh, environment, which I think that the 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 Labour sort of internalised in particular. You know, I felt particularly sensitive about this idea of this you know plastering of them as both enemies of the people and the and the metropolitan elite and so on, when their whole political identity was bound up with working class democracy and working class representation. And so I think that's also in some way left its left its kind of mark. Right? Um, but now I think that the difficulty now, uh, and it's not just Labour, but, but of course, but um, is that we have a situation where it is obvious, really, even to many people who supported Brexit, that economically at least it just has not worked right now many of us you know anticipated that and we were told that it was project fear and all the rest of it um but really i mean of course there are some kind of diehards who will sort of you know always kind of you know find some statistic that says oh yes but oh yes but oh yes but but i mean the basic the, the, you know and or and it's all become very confused in with well what about COVID effects and what about ukraine war effects and all the rest of it but i mean the basic issue of the fact that trade with the european union is now 
much more difficult. You know, this is this is this is this is this is just like ladybird stuff, right? I mean, if you increase barriers to trade, the trade decreases. Uh, you know, I mean, actually, you know, free market economists used to, you know, many of whom, are, some of whom are Brexiters, used to understand that very well, right? This is straightforward. But on the other hand, um, the 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 at best optimistic idea that what would happen would be the trade with other with, with, with you know with the rest of the world would somehow compensate for that you know we can see that's not going to happen again most of us knew it wasn't going to happen but now really you know the evidence you know the the, the, the evidence is in um you can see how small the value of the australian and new zealand trade deals are you can see there's not you know, an Indian deal now looks very difficult. Um, you can see a US deal is unlikely to happen. And anyway, we'd only add, you know, a tiny, um, I think the, the best estimate for even a US deal is something like 0.2% GDP over 15 years, whereas the whereas the anticipated loss as we got with respect to EU trade is 4% over 15 years. So, 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 and that being the case, how can any political party or any government have a serious economic policy if it's a taboo subject to actually talk about, you know, what is one of the central economic issues of the time and to talk about what is the national economic strategy, if you like. Um, and so it then so it becomes now, it, it, there's no way that Sunak can say that, right? Because because it's because because it's it, it's still so, the party is still so riven that he would be instantly torn apart, right? Starmer feels it clearly feels that as well to some extent, you know, and and and, and in a way, I think he probably also feels well, you know, the Tory if the Tories can just implode on their own and I can just sort of keep quiet, you know, then why why you know why rock the boat by talking about Brexit? Why not just let them fall apart? win the next election and then you know and then we'll see but i think if that is what he's thinking that that is a dangerous strategy because unless the ground is prepared for a labor administration to do something different about brexit then um then it would not you know it, it would be very very easy then for that to be portrayed as not having any democratic legitimacy so if they don't put in their manifesto something pretty substantive about brexit I think they're going to suffer, you know, suffer if they then try to do something. Now, the other argument is to say, well, they don't intend to do anything substantive about Brexit, um, but that doesn't mean that there aren't things that can be done. I mean, you know, you mentioned the sort of "Make Brexit Work" slogan or whatever it is, which I think is the star. You know, you say, well, you know, the Brexit kind of can't work, but but I mean, but there is some space there. I think you know for things that even without even without revisiting the fundamentals of the single market and the customs union, let alone rejoining the EU, you know, we could have, and they could negotiate a more comprehensive trade agreement. And the trade agreement is, and built into the trade agreement is a review of it in 2025, uh, which will probably be you know, the beginning of the next government, you know, where you could, for example, have alignment on sanitary and phytosanitary regulations you know, um, um, animals livestock um, uh, seeds plants stuff so on. Um, and you could do that and you could and that would also by the way make the northern ireland situation much easier in, 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 in and of itself uh, you could have a mobility chapter allowing service workers like musicians and so on this was offered by the eu as part of the negotiations and could fairly easily now be done so you could even within the existing framework because don't forget that that existing framework that trade and cooperation agreement it was made minimal by the fact that Boris Johnson and David Frost, his negotiator, had this absolutist idea about it had to be sovereignty, you know, in other words, that, that no kind of regulations, aligned regulations with like, with the EU could be, you know, could, you know, could be acceptable. And at some point, um, you have to say, well, what price are you willing to pay for that almost kind of theological idea about sovereignty? Mm -hmm. So there's a little bit of space for Labour within the... Um, um, within the kind of the framework of make Brexit work, but it won't take you very far. It won't get you that 4% that 
that leaving the single market has has taken off GDP. Um, so you know, and, and and then of course the big then question issue becomes okay. So 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 what lay behind the single market, Labour's reticence on single market, and I think the answer was um, again what they thought some of their traditional workers would think about immigration and freedom of movement. Because you can't have a singular market without freedom of movement for people. Um, but on that, I would say um, that, you know, that, well, one is that, you know, you might hope that Labour, which has always been regarded itself as an internationalist party, might have a bit more, um, uh, you know, might show a bit more um, courage, if you like, about sort of perhaps confronting some of its voters. But more to the point, I mean, actually, what we've seen is that immigration levels are really hardly any different since Brexit, right? Um, what's happened is that there's been a shift in uh, in, 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 in immigration uh, from uh, the European Union to outside the European Union, which is not necessarily what Brexit, what, what, what the voters who have, who have had that kind of uh, anti-immigration motivation is not necessarily what they wanted. Um, and, and to my mind, the other thing about this is that um, is that you know it's quite easy for economists to talk about immigration and freedom of movement of people as if they were the same thing, you know. But that's only true if you look at it through the very narrow perspective of the labour market and what jobs are needed to be filled and so on. But I think that one of the things about freedom of movement that was so extraordinary was the capacity that it gave people to move around, not just, you know, you've got a visa and you can work in this job for X number of months, but actually to move around for all kinds of reasons, to to uh, to marry, to make families, to, mm. to uh, and, and at different times to very easily then say, okay, well, but now we're going to go back to Germany or whatever because our parents are not well, and now we're going to come to the, the UK because our parents, you know, uh, you know, now our parents are dead, but 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 we we've got a bit more freedom to do that, or or now our kids are going to be changing school, and so that will be a good time, and and so it's a completely different kind of notion that goes way beyond economics, and of course, the issue with Brexit is not just that freedom of movement has ceased in relation to the rights of people in the EU to come to to, to the United Kingdom, but of course people in the United Kingdom, or at least people within Great Britain, have lost their freedom of movement rights with respect to the the with, 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 with respect to the European Union. Um, you know, which is a which is a, which which is a, which is a huge loss in all kinds of ways. Yeah, I mean, it's it's that's a very interesting. I mean, it's it, from a looking from us through a Scottish prism, it it, it looks. The Labour Party's position looks very odd in many respects. Uh, one is that the reason that uh, the SNP are so successful in Scotland is because they tack to the left. They were always left, uh, but they've they've always taken a left wing perspective. They've never been attracted really to anything other, and they look at a Labour Party that's tacking to the right, and they are saying, "Well, that's just plain daft." because you're now squabbling over <laughs> a limited number of voters. Uh, we did the sensible thing and went further left than the Labour Party could, and we scooped up Labour votes by their thousands and hundreds of thousands, and have retained them because they continued to be left. And then they look at uh, Labour at Westminster and say, what do they mean when they say they're not going to cooperate? For example, the likelihood is that there will be a Tory revival of some sort at some stage over the next two years, if, assuming it, it takes two years for the, there to be a general election. Mm -hmm. And there'll be some sort of revival. And even if there isn't, there will be a, 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 a sort of a, rather a, a somewhat imaginary revival in the sense that the, the press will get solidly behind whoever the Tory candidate is, because that's the way things are done in the UK. And we'll present Stam in a very poor light indeed however much he tacks uh, to, to, to the right or to the centre. Uh, and therefore, you may end up with a, just a handful of seats in a Labour majority. And to say at this stage, we don't intend to cooperate uh, with anyone else except the Lib Dems. Mm. Sykes, from a distance, it looks bizarre because you would say, hold on a second, you fought so hard to get into power. The easiest thing in the world would be to sit down and say, <clears throat> as long as you guys don't vote against us, right, we, we can do something here. 
But to take the contrary approach and say, we're never, ever going to cooperate with you, even though they do cooperate with nationalist parties in Ireland, uh, yeah. seems bizarre. Is there any reason that you can construe for this? I mean, that's I mean, that's sort of beyond, I guess, my kind of um, my my kind of, you know, Brexit brief. And, and, and I mean, I guess goes, you know, deep into the history of the relationship between Labour and Scotland and between okay. and between Labour and between Labour and, and SNP. Um, but but you know but, but 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 you know nonetheless as 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 in fact you know Brexit as well showed us in the, in the period when 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 Parliament was so kind of river that um, that that ultimately you know if people if parties will not work together then by default they let somebody else. Precisely. Run the agenda, you know, and in, 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 in this case, the Tories. Um, and so I don't know, but but I mean, the, I suppose the question is: is whatever Starmer may say now, perhaps you know, doesn't necessarily. Um, I mean, I, I assume I'm going to say this isn't really my kind of my, my 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 kind of area, but I mean, I assume that Labour feel that the. Um, the kind of coalition of chaos line that the Tories ran against them in the 2015 election was it? Um, that that the, 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 you know, that they feel that that that, that damaged Labour, and so they feel that as if they have to say this um, um, stuff about SNP. But if you, know, you look at the polls, if people are asked why are you now supporting Labour if there was an election tomorrow, that's the very thing people point to. They say uh, Tory chaos. <laughs> they yeah, say, yeah. Oh yeah, I know. I mean, it's, it's a mess. They say. I mean, when, you look at what, when you look at what has happened since two thousand and fifteen, I mean, that coalition yeah. chaos line. But, you know, I mean, I, I think the other thing is is just that, and it's a legacy or a consequence of first past the post system is that, is that, is that, is that political parties, uh, you know, are, are so tribal. You know, um, and uh, obviously, you know, in, in the UK for years and years and years. Before you know the SNP uh, uh, sort of you know huge huge rise of the SNP uh, uh, in Scotland, but you know it was for however many decades it was you know it, it, you know it really was Conservative or Labour, and that was yeah. that and that tribalism is so is so is you know is so ingrained that I mean you never got it's quite interesting that you know in all the, those kind of Brexit parliamentary conflicts a lot of the connections that would be made between between people in because there were certainly connections being made between people on the Labour, uh, Labour and SNP and, 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 and Liberal Democrats, but it was very much a backbench, uh, backbench contacts. It certainly didn't come from the Labour front bench. I don't think. I think it was yeah. coming from people like Hillary Benn and Yvette Cooper and people like that. Yeah, I mean, it's like, it's it's an interesting dynamic, and I, 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 I suspect it all devolves down on whether. Keir Starmer is a statesman or a politician, uh, and uh, it may well be that he will develop from being a politician to being a statesman, because some of these decisions are statesman-like decisions, where you actually put a stake in the ground and say, you know, this is what we stand for and this is what we will not stand for, which I think might be attractive to lots of uh, swing voters, uh, and certainly maybe to uh, a considerable number of Labour voters who might... I mean, what people are looking for just now, I suspect, and I may be completely wrong in this, but it's an impression at least, is that they're looking for stability. They're saying, you know, we, we've had enough of chaos. Mm. <laughs> what we want is somebody who's absolutely stable. Mm. Uh, and they're not going to get it from the, the Tories. I, I don't think anyone sincerely believes that, frankly. I think mm. what they may believe is that uh, Labour may slip back into its old habits, but that will be a hard sell. I suspect, and it won't work at all if there's an election within two years because people have got. I know the, the electorate is often accused of having a short memory, but I think some of the things that have happened more recently have left an indelible stamp yeah. in the minds of many people, coupled with the fact that we're just about to enter maybe the worst winter in living living memory, and we could well have people starving, we could well have people uh, who can neither heat nor eat. And the thing is, is say, although, people, although as you say, people's political memories are often sort of short. The thing that's interesting about things is that is that one is that is that that's true all the time, 
until there is some particular thing that lodges. And once something does lodge in the kind of collective political memory, then it lodges there for an awful long time, you know, which is why people still, you know, still now talk about, you know, the winter of discontent and, uh, and going cap in hand to the IMF and so on. You know, when that is, you know, that's before most, well, before many voters were even born, you know, so. Yeah. Um, so, and I think, so I think you're right. I, I think, well, you know, that, 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 actually that kind of, particularly that kind of Liz Truss interlude and the, you know, the, the, the market reaction to that, I think is the kind of thing which will resonate, you know, certainly, certainly at the time of the next election, I would think. Yeah, I, mean, I think you know, listening to what Tory MPs and Tory supporters are saying, it seems to be the case that they feel that they have completely lost that impression in the electors' mind that uh, they were uh, a safe pair of hands when it came to the economy and that Labour wasn't. And therefore, even though you didn't like anything else about Conservative policies, that's the one that ought to have major that's appeal because yeah. it was about safety and security. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's people are now saying, well, that's gone. We'll never get that back again, because uh, they can't they can't see the economy turning round, uh, and if it doesn't turn round and there's an election, um, I mean, Labour could find themselves in power with scores and scores of a majority, but who knows? You never can tell. If you were to look, as the Americans say, down the pike, Chris, <laughs> to this time next year, if you had to sketch out the political environment, uh, what would your thoughts be? This time next year, well, I mean, obviously, the, you know, the crucial, the, the, the crucial question now is the one that, you know, you've, you've just alluded to, which will there be, be an election by then or not? Um, and um, I think that the, you know, this, I mean, this will, this will be what I'll be writing about on the, in the blog on Friday, um, is that the, Sunak uh, regime, if I can call it that, is going to very quickly face some some pretty irrecons irreconcilable problems. Because okay, at the moment, um, yeah, you know, there's the sort of thing where we're all going to rally behind the leader and so on and so forth. But actually, you know, his political position is is, is quite weak for all kinds of of, of reasons. Um, firstly, because it, you know, okay, he inherited this majority from Boris Johnson, but that majority, which was 80 in 2019, I think is probably a little bit less now because of various violations and so on. But although it looked large, it was always fragile. And right from the beginning, um, you know, there were actually quite a lot, a lot of rebellions from MPs and, very, and kind of U turns made in response to that and so on and so forth. And it's because of the fact that. Johnson put together this. The, the, the basic theme was the get Brexit done, right? So they all, you know, uh, there was that. But apart from that, there wasn't anything really to the kind of, you know, to 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 to, uh, to link them together. And so you've now got, you know, this extremely sort of factionalized group of of of, of MPs. And so what does that mean? Well, it means that. Firstly, because of what Liz Truss did, the whole basis that Sunak has come into power is that he's going to be reimposing austerity again, right? Mm -hmm. You know, Johnson had sort of, you know, certainly, you know, well, that's all over, and you know, rather airily kind of dismissed anything to do with, 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 with public spending, which perhaps was always going to uh, get us to the point where we were. But the Liz Truss kind of Institute of Economic Affairs, you know, Laffer curve theory stuff, you know, this, this. Put us on this sudden emergency trajectory, to which they say, although we could debate it, they say, "Well, spending cuts is what's going to happen." So, all right, are Tory MPs going to accept that? Particularly those red wall Tory, uh, Tory, uh, Tory MPs, um, who will be know that that will affect their constituencies very badly. So, will they rebel on that? And, and you know, it only takes, you know, well, less than forty now, and thirty-eight MPs or whatever to rebel, and then the government. Uh, well, certainly, if it was a financial measure and the government couldn't get its financial plan through, then the government would, would I think, undoubtedly fall in those circumstances. Um, now, maybe precisely because of the of the situation, you could imagine Sunak saying, "Well, look, if you don't support me, then there'll be an election and you'll lose your seat, and and that will kind of concentrate the minds of them, perhaps." Right. But then, if we think about the issues to do with Brexit, and in particular the Northern Ireland Protocol thing, which I was just which we were just talking about. What if they what if there's a blow up over that, then those people, those ERG 
you know, kind of the ones that called themselves the Spartans, the really diehard kind of members of the AG, they are not open to the argument, oh, well, if you collapse the government, then you'll lose your seats or you'll, you know, you'll destroy the Tory party or anything like that. Because these people are not the kinds of politicians that most of us are used to in this country. These people are fanatical ideologues and they believe and they have believed for, in some cases, you know, for decades, uh, that, that th this cause of theirs trumps everything else, right? Um, and so they wouldn't have any, any, I don't think, you know, they might have a hesitation, but it wouldn't be a, a long hesitation. Um, and then, of course, the other thing is that, that um, people are saying slightly wrongly, I think, that they're saying, oh, well, what Trust did with her kind of, you know, libertarian, as I say, Institute of Economic Affairs kind of approach is that she blew it and therefore it's now dead in the water. But that isn't true, I don't think. Um, because what blew her out of the water was one part of that libertarian stuff, which was the part which was to do with the idea that you could cut taxes and raise growth. But the other part of her plan, don't forget, was what she calls supply side reforms that never even got announced. Yeah. And these were going to be the things about deregulation. Now, that agenda is still Sunak's agenda, I would say, because he is a, he himself is actually a libertarian, you know, he's all certainly on that kind of free market wing of the Tory party. Um, so there will be things like, for example, assuming he tries to do them, there will be things like planning, you know, the idea of reforming, and by reforming, we probably mean reducing, you know, um, protections, the planning system. Now, if he tries to do that, there's going to be a swathe of objections from Tory MPs, perhaps more the blue wall people. I mean, it's interesting that today he's made it clear that he, that he's not going to go ahead with fracking, or he's going to he's going to U-turn on the Liz Trust U-turn on <laughs> fracking, and so 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 and so will not try to reintroduce fracking. And that is undoubtedly a reflection of the fact that already Trust could see how much. Um, uh, opposition there was within amongst Tory MPs yeah. to fracking. So what about planning? And then also, you know, we've touched on it before, but let's come back again to immigration. One of the ideas that Trust had to promote growth, and I'm sure that it's an idea that uh, Sunak shares, because in this sense they're ideologically very close, is that they think rightly that immigration is necessary to economic growth. Mm -hmm. But um, but we know that many Brexiters, including Suella Braverman, who you mentioned in your your, 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 your introduction to the show, um, Suella Braverman is, is now back as Home Secretary. Um, and we know that she and, and, of course, many other of the Brexiters in the party are very, very, are very, very hostile to increasing yeah. uh, number, uh, immigration numbers. So, again, immediately there's a kind of, you know, the, 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 there's a flashpoint, again, a flashpoint that goes right back to 2016 when Brexit was sold to some people as a global project about, you know, sort of trade and so on and so forth, and to other people as a kind of a, a, a well, the opposite of global, I suppose, as a local project mm -hmm. of immigration control and sort of protecting traditional ways of life. Blah, 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 blah. So, um, uh, and, and, and that fishing has never gone away. So mm -hmm. over all of these things, um, Say uh, you know regulation, planning, immigration, uh, spending cuts. Um, these are all things where I think the Tory Party is just you know is just waiting to fall apart again. Yeah. And don't forget that some of these people um, have well, I, th I this is a bit speculative on my part. And maybe you won't agree, but I think that some of these Tory MPs have just now become addicted to the drama of chaos and to the mm -hmm. drama of, you know, constantly having these kind of rebellions yeah. and coups yeah. and you know, all of this kind of thing. And 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 some of them, I'm not, I'm not going to name names, but I think most people would be able to identify some of the people. I mean, some of them almost seem to sort of be, you know, have this almost kind of like sort of pompous, self-important, yeah. you, know, you know, oh, you know, we, you know, I'm the kingmaker, or we are the kingmakers, and you know, um, and and so I think this is why, you know, for some time now, since the summer certainly, I've been describing the Tory Party as an unleadable party, and that's partly to do with the idea that um, that that no one could lead it, but it's partly to do, I think, with the fact that that some of these people, it's almost a kind of nihilistic thing that yeah. they actually don't want to be led. You know, I think, I think, I this think, is a government which is basically run out of, it's run out of 
it's run out of everything. You know, it shouldn't yeah. really. If it weren't for the accident to the system, it wouldn't go on. It yeah. wouldn't. It wouldn't go on existing. I think that's definitely the case, and, and a lot of people from Europe say to me, "This is absolutely crazy. These people have run out of steam. They don't know what they're doing. Uh, they're all fighting amongst themselves like ferrets in a sack." And why doesn't your constitution take care of this? And of course, the answer is, well, you know, what constitution? Uh, uh, and they don't understand that either. They, they, they say there must be some rule that prevents one party from deciding who the prime minister is without a general election. And the answer is, no, there isn't. It just made up on the hoof and somebody said, this is a good idea and it's been, we're stuck with it. Uh, we're, we've only got about five minutes left, Chris. This has been a very educational and entertaining. Um, do you want to take a couple of seconds to talk about your book and how people can get it? We've, we've got oh, a yeah. picture on the screen. Yeah, yeah, Brexit unfolded. Um, so that's, I mean, that tells the story of Brexit, not not why, not why it happened. And, and so it starts from the day after the referendum and it goes through to uh, the end of the transition period. And um, so obviously, in a sense, quite a few things have happened since then. Um, but it's still, uh, it, 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 but that story still remains very, I hope, very interesting and very kind of pertinent. Um, and of course, the book also explains why uh, many kinds of things, including the current Northern Ireland protocol situation, why they they were they were they were built in uh, to what happened in the period two thousand and sixteen to to two thousand and twenty one. Um, and it's. Um, it's had quite good reaction, actually. I mean, it's 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 been um, it, well. That, that is a review there, which is taken off um, uh, off Amazon, uh, and who I think is, if I'm not mistaken, is is by a, 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 a quite a well-known economics professor, if it's the person of the same name. Um, and um, and the book itself has had some nice endorsements from um, Caroline Lucas, the Green MP, uh, from. Um, from Sarah Carey, the Irish journalist, from Jonathan Dimbleby, the uh, broadcaster, uh, from Brian Cox, the scientist, and uh, Howard Goodall, the composer, and a, a range of people, you know, different kinds of backgrounds and different kinds of, sort of expertise, if you like, saying they like it. Um, so yeah, I mean, it would be great if people were to were to buy that. You can get it through, obviously, through Amazon, the links there, but you can get it through. Um, uh, you know, uh, other online retailers are available. Let, let, let me blow your trumpet for you, if I may, oh, okay. uh, a little bit more. Uh, so, but before I do so, just let, remind people the details for getting the book are on the screen. You go to the Amazon.co.uk and you can follow the rest and the suffix of the of the uh, the link there. Uh, this is what people are saying about Brexit and beyond, uh, which Chris writes. They're saying the best guide to follow on Brexit for intelligent analysis. Uh, this is from German television. Quotes, by far one of the best analysts of Brexit, Sarah Carey of the Times, consistently outstanding analysis of Brexit, Jonathan Dimbleby. The best writer on Brexit, Chris Lockwood, Europe editor of The Economist, a must read for anyone following Brexit. That's David Allen Green of the FT. The doyen of Brexit commentators, Chris John of the Irish Times. I don't want to... <laughs> Spare your blushes anymore. Well, well, he, he, well the, those of course relate to the blog, the, the blog, not, uh, not the book. But of the yeah, blog, I will, uh, I will, I will just say, yeah. I, I will yeah. just say, I will blow my own trumpet in this sense, which is that if you Google uh, or other um, search best Brexit blog, then my blog comes up first. But yeah, I have right. to add to that that if you Google worst Brexit blog, it also comes up first. <laughs> <laughs> So, well, that's very noble of you to make that plain. <laughs> so, you, but can I just sad. say to everyone watching, if you've enjoyed uh, Chris tonight, uh, you've got two places you can uh, get a permanent record of uh, of his thoughts. One is the book Brexit, book Brexit Unfolded, uh, and also, and I would strongly recommend this, uh, go to the blog Brexit and Beyond. Uh, as Chris said, if you Google it, it will come up there. And you'll find a lot there of uh, enormous interest. Well, we've run out of time, I'm afraid, Chris. Uh, thank you again for being with us tonight. I hope you can stay on for a few minutes after we go off air and uh, we can just uh, 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 have, a, have a very quick chat. Uh, let me just uh, bring our, uh, our uh, session uh, tonight, the show tonight, to a close. Uh, obviously, a big thank you to Chris uh, and remember his book and uh, Brexit and Beyond. 
and you saw the full details on the screen. You also probably saw the results of the opinion poll we've been carrying out. And by and large, uh, if I'm not paraphrasing too much, uh, those who wanted Brexit reversed uh, came in at 91% on Facebook, YouTube and Twitter. And a big thank you to all of you out there for joining us tonight. Uh, we hope you've enjoyed this TNT show as ever. We have a formidable list of guests lined up <clears throat> for the future shows. This is the place for the big hitters. And remember the India Live What's On guy. The TNT show will be back next week, November the 2nd at the same time. And we will be joined by a group uh, calling themselves Lib Dems for Independence. Uh, and I'm dying to find out uh, what, what they're about. Uh, as always, a reminder to look out for my column in the Sunday National this weekend. You'll find it in the seven days supplement. And I suspect I will be saying some unkind words about our new Prime Minister. Uh, and also, let me just mention again, the crowdfunder, if you've got a chance to contribute, we'd be very grateful. So to all of you, thanks for joining us. Look after each other, stay safe and take care. Good night, everyone. <laughs>